Good evening to all our viewers. Welcome to each one of you to our day 15 of the seminar entitled, Where the Past Meets the Future. Thank you so much for studying the Bible prophecies with us at each meeting, as we have been presenting the Bible prophecies that are relevant to you and to the times that we are all living in. Yesterday evening, you were blessed with the topic entitled, The Blessed Hope. And tonight's message is the great conspiracy. This is a three week Daniel and Revelation prophecy seminar that started on the 21st of March and it will complete on the 10th of April. So this is our last week. And we have been blessed throughout this journey together with you studying the prophecies. The seminar is on YouTube every day except on Thursdays and our timing is starting at half seven. On Saturday, which is the last day of our seminar, uh, the timing is at 11 a.m. So the service begins at 11 a.m. this Saturday, which is the last day for our seminar. All our programs are available for you to view on YouTube. In case you have missed any of our pre previous uh, presentations, you can go ahead and watch them on YouTube. I would suggest that you subscribe to the YouTube channel so that you are notified of any upcoming new release videos. You can also visit our website, which is manchestersda.church. If you have any questions during or after the presentation, please feel free to post them on the YouTube chat, or you could fill up a form on the website that I gave. And we will do our very best to answer these questions in our next meeting. We also have a special prayer group who has been praying for all our viewers from the very beginning that we started the seminar. In fact, even before then. And each of our prayer coordinators have been praying for you. And if you have any requests, please put them on the chat so that we can pray for your particular prayer request. Our presenter today is Seema Moyo. He is a registered mental health nurse who is happily married to Dorcas, and they are blessed with four beautiful children. They attend the Altrincham Seventh-day Adventist Church. His love for prophecy began during his high school days when he enrolled with the VOP Bible Correspondence School. The secrets of God have been revealed for our consumption and by availing ourselves, God reveals himself. He continues to view this world from prophetic lenses as it helps explain confounding issues and pacify anxieties caused by a lot of upheavals and turmoil around us. Elder Seema says that prophecy is a keyhole into God's thinking about our future. So before I hand over the time to uh, Mr. Seema Moyo, I'm going to ask that if you can please bow your heads as we pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for yet another opportunity to come before you to learn about the prophecies, the times that we are living in. Father, we pray that you would let your Holy Spirit, Spirit speak to each one of us who are present here, that as we uh, learn, as we read, that you would open our hearts to un, uh, accept the truth, that you'd open our eyes to see what you have in store for us. We pray that you would bless Elder uh, Moyo, that you would speak through him too. Thank you for all that you've done for each of our lives. Bless, please bless every one of our viewers and all the challenges that they are going through, that they will be drawn closer to you and that you would help them in their time of need. In Christ's name I pray, amen. Now we hand over the time to Seema Moyo. Welcome to our viewers that are watching us live. 
May I also welcome those who will be watching us in the future. I must thank God for making the provision of this technological advancement that uh, when someone misses the live event, they can view it uh, in, 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 in following times or the future times. This is a powerful tool. In other words, God wants to make it a witness to the world that no one can miss anything because despite not being there the time when it happens, you can still dig into the internet and find it. So this is the availability of the knowledge, which is actually part of the prophetic message, which uh, the Lord Jesus Christ himself met uh, when he was here by saying that the gospel of the kingdom shall be preached to all the world for a testimony or for a witness, and then the end shall come. That's Matthew 24. Now, it is important that I mention that our subjects have all been based or are still based on Daniel and the Revelation. There will be overlaps. God has an intention for that because the more the emphasis, the important the message. Tonight, I want to thank God for bringing you here uh, into the, uh, to this site or this channel that you will learn with me what he has in store for us. Allow me to share the screen. My faith is that my brothers and sisters have already prayed. And it is indeed my pleasure that I will ride on the wings of their prayers tonight. Please, those who are praying, continue to do so. As, in, as introduced by my dear sister, Diamond Sade, our subject is on the screen, the great conspiracy. It is always amazing that uh, we have come to know this word so much, but more so on the theories, conspiracy theories. I'm not going to talk about theories tonight. I will be talking about the great conspiracy. The world has seen many conspiracies. The world has heard of many conspiracies, but the one that we're talking of or about tonight is the greatest of them all. Now, I always like to put definitions to things. Maybe it's my way of learning, but it makes me clearer on some subjects or notions because unless I understand the basic understanding of whatever the idea is, it becomes difficult for me to uh, go beyond that uh, uh, first uh, appearance of the word. So that is why I chose to um, at least define what conspiracy is. I didn't look for a, 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 a verbose, or should I say a, an overly explained definition. The one on the screen is simple enough for anyone to understand. Now, it says it's a secret plan by a group to do something unlawful or harmful. In other words, a, a plan or intention to break the law. Now I had to underscore the word unlawful there as you will see why it is important. What is unlawful in eschatological terms? In other words, in the greater scheme of things, what is unlawful? 1 John 3 verse four says, whosoever committed sin transgresseth also the law. For sin is the transgression of the law. In other words, sinning is unlawful. What it simply means is doing the opposite of what the law wants, one breaks the law. Surely there must be some way where we get this. Where does sin start from? Who sinned from the beginning? As you can see the verse on the screen, 1 John 3, verse 8 to 9. It says, he that committed sin is of the devil. 
for the devil sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that the, he might destroy the works of the devil, whosoever is born of God. Now, the reason why Christ had to come, he had to come and reverse or put a stop to this unlawlessness that had taken effect of the planet. Now, let us look at, we want to, we are following a thread here. So if the devil uh, started sinning from the beginning, now, let, me, let me just go back a little. He says, he that committed sin is of the devil. I want us to underline that. So let's see what we are talking about here, because we're talking about prophecy. There surely must be a, a link somehow to this verse. <clears throat> Okay. And the dragon, uh, I'm trying to move some graphics here. I can't see part of the screen. Let me just minimize that. Okay. Sorry to interject, Elder. I think the screen is just still on the first slide for us. Sorry, it's still on the first slide. That's correct, sir. Oh, okay. Um, let me just come out and see if I can load it afresh. Let me start by stop uh, sharing, and then I'll try and share. Okay. All right, is it changing on your side? Now, so I've got your screen, but yes. uh, do you want to put it on full screen? Uh, it's okay. I can see what's happening here. I, I've got it on full screen here. Let me come out again. I think what it wants me to do is to start by. Or maybe you need to switch the screens. Maybe is yes, dual screen. Let, yeah. Let, let, let me let me come out. Okay. okay. So what it, what it wants me, if I stopped sharing? That's correct, yes. Yes, so what I will do is let me play from the start here, because what it does is then, uh, let me go to, yeah, I'm using a new machine, so that's the idea. Um, it's not working, okay, let's see. Okay. Right, tell me if it's moving now, please. Yes. It's moving now. Yes. Okay, let me start again. I'm sorry about that uh, technological issues. There, sh there will be glitches as long as we're on earth. I started by defining what conspiracy is. Uh, as you can see on the screen, it says a secret plan by a group to do something unlawful or harmful. In other words, it is a plan or an intention to break the law. I'll have to go faster here. Uh, what is unlawful in eschatological terms? 1 John 3 verse 4 says, whosoever committed sin transgresses also the law, for sin is the transgression of law. Now, I want us to, to follow an idea uh, that I want to bring across. Maybe uh, just shelve the one that you, want, you, you think you understand and, and listen to this. Um, I'll keep checking if my screen is going. Uh, is it still going over there? Oh, good. Thank you. Now, who sinned from the beginning? 1 John 3 verse 8 and, and 9 says, He that committeth sin is of the devil, for the devil sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil, whosoever is born of God. So Christ had to come down to deal with the great conspiracy or with the conspiracy in general, because conspiracy is the habit or the tendency or the plan or intention to break the law. Now, I'm looking at Revelation 12 verse nine here. I want to identify who this guy is, who's seen from the beginning. And he says here, and the great dragon was held down that ancient serpent called the devil and Satan. So we can define here that 
devil who is mentioned in First John there is the same as Satan who is um, uh, 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 we seen from the beginning. So devil, Satan, or dragon is the same thing as we shall see. When you go to Revelation 13, 1 and 2, you can find the same thought in Daniel chapter 7, verse 1 to 8. It says, then I saw a beast with ten horns and seven heads rising out of the sea. There uh, there were ten royal crowns on its horns and blasphemous names on its head. The beast I, uh, I saw was like a leopard with the feet of a bear and the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave the beast his power and his throne and great authority. Now, we've identified that it is the devil who sinned or who became unlawful right from the beginning. So it is still him who is uh, doing these things. So the great conspiracy has to be done by this beast that we're talking about, the dragon, uh, the devil, or Satan, as he is called. But we know that the authority, we've been talking about the prophecy uh, the past few days, the past uh, weeks, that the beast stands for the kingdom or nation. Now, the, this particular beast that we're talking about is the last beast that's going to exist until Jesus comes. So let us see, uh, go further. Forget about all that you've had in terms of the beast. Today, I want to concentrate on what this beast has done so far. The question comes, whose law becomes a big question. Whose law did the devil break or intentionally break or plan to break? The beginning, the foundation of this prophecy can be found in Daniel 7, verse 24 and 25. And the 10 horns are the 10 kings who will rise from this kingdom. After them, another king, different from the earlier ones, will rise and subdue three kings. We, we've learned about this. When the, this beast had 10 uh, horns, um, it so happened that another one grew up by uprooting three, and then it became stouter than all these kingdoms, uh, all these uh, crowns, all, all these uh, uh, horns. And unfortunately for this one, it was given eyes and mouth, and it spoke great things. Now, the verse says, he will speak out against the Most High and oppress the saints of the Most High, intending to change the appointed times and laws, and saints will be given into his hand. And for a time, times, another time. Now, let's go back a little. There's something about uh, this. If you go to Revelation 12, especially, after the serpent was held down from heaven, 1217 will tell you that he came and fought the offspring of a woman, which was a virtuous woman, the true church of God. But the criteria of how he identified the children of the woman, he used they, uh, they are keeping of the law. So that means to him, keeping the law pointed to him that who's, I mean, to, to, to tell him who's tar uh, which targets to go for. Everyone who kept the law became the target. Now, who were they keeping the law? They were keeping the law of God, obviously. But this beast, as we, shall, as we are seeing here, or as we have, have learned, he doesn't only vanquish the kings here below. What he does, he picks a fight with the most high. He speaks arrogant words with the most high. He doesn't end there. He goes after the saints of the most high. Who are the saints of the most high? Those who are keeping the laws of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now, that's the framework that I want us to, to be looking at and to, to, to think as to why or what this conspiracy is and how the enemy has fought the, the saints of God over the years. We learned about the period that was going to be given to the beast to fight 
the saints of God, we know uh, the period to be uh, 1,260 days, uh, or which uh, stands for uh, literal years, 1,260 years. As explained earlier, it started uh, from 538. How do we know it is 538 AD? It's because that's when this beast got hold of the minds of the people and controlled not only they are uh, the, the, the politically or control them politically, but as well as spiritual, trying to control their consciences as to who and uh, they should and they should not worship. Now, if conspiracy therefore is planning of breaking the law, then it suffices to conclude that Daniel seven verse twenty five uh, that the conspirators, conspirators is the antichrist, as we learned in another lesson before. The devil himself is the conspirator, and we. We, we have to go with that understanding. Now, now that we've identified who the conspirator is, we can identify who uh, or what he has done. We have also identified the law of God, but we are going to expand on that as we go on. There is a verse that we've been talking about all along, 2 Thessalonians chapter two, a very powerful verse which was a prediction by Paul writing to the Thessalonians. He wrote as he was shown that they, those people at the time, shouldn't have been alarmed because these things had to happen before Christ could come again. Now, let us recap on this verse. Let no one deceive you in any way, for it will not come until which is the it there is the coming of the Lord. So for it will not come until the rebellion occurs and the men of lawlessness the sign of destruction is revealed. Now, I had to bold and underline that lawlessness. It links directly to the conspiracy uh, definition, which is the breaking of the law. In other words, trying to do away with the law. He will oppose and exalt himself above every so-called God or object of worship. So he will sit himself in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. I suppose the whole of that verse has been explained, but let us concentrate today as to what this conspirator has done over the, over the years. This verse I alluded to before, which says, and the dragon was enraged with the woman and went to make war with the rest of the offspring who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. Now, if you wanted the dragon to run after you, all you had to do is to keep the commandments of God and keep the testimony of Jesus Christ. This is the conspirator. That's how he's identified these people uh, he wanted to persecute. Now, the book, Great Controversy, written by Ellen G. White, it says, uh, the persecution of the saints of years began with Emperor Nero in the year AD 50, uh, 54 to 68. The more saints were persecuted and, ex and executed, their living example and dying testimony were a constant witness for the truth and where least expected, the subjects of Satan were leaving his service and enlisting under the banner of Christ. What that means is the more the saints, those who were keeping the law of God were killed, it seemed to be counterproductive for the enemy. Because the more the saints were killed, the more those who did not have the light received it and started to question things, and more of, the, of those people were converted into Christianity, uh, into keeping the, uh, the, 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 commandment, the commandments of God. Now, it becomes a, pro a problem. Now, you can see the enemy or the conspirators sitting at a conference or at a board asking to say, you know what, we are trying this start strategy. It's not working. What is working therefore? We are killing them, but they're increasing in number. We are killing them and persecuting them, putting them, uh, throwing them into uh, dungeons or uh, putting them into uh, uh, colosseums and with the live hungry lions, instead of diminishing them in numbers, we're actually sowing the seed for more saints. The conspirators had to come up with a plan. Satan therefore laid his plans to war more successfully against the government of God. Now, let us discuss about that uh, idea. 
The conspirator is fighting God himself. In our previous lesson, we've learned that when the enemy was cast out of heaven because he had tried to usurp the power of God, the city of God, the authority of God, and the, the, the sovereignty of God, he didn't end there. He came down and wanted, but the, the idea of some planting or replacing God still remained. How would he do that? He did it in the Garden of Eden by presenting a lie. And by so doing, he took over the dominion of Adam and Eve, which they had been given. And from that time, they lost it. And they never had dominion over things. The evidence is a watch. We can see it around us. We can see it in our families. We can see it in animals that we keep. We can see it everywhere. But look at that. Satan therefore laid his plans to war more successfully against the government of God by planting his banner in the Christian church. Now, that's the first strategy. Because he saw that by fighting from outside the church, he wasn't succeeding. He was trying something within the Christian church. In the following, uh, in the followers of Christ, or if the followers of Christ could be deceived. Now, he's not killing them, but he would rather deceive them because killing was counterproductive to his plans. And what, would, uh, what did he do? He says, if the followers of Christ could be deceived and led to displease God, then their strength, fortitude, and firmness would fail and they would fall and easy prey. Can you see the strategy there? He's planning, he's seeing that the, the, the strategy of, of persecuting and killing wasn't working and effective, so he tries something. What does he try? Go with me. The adversary now endeavor to gain by artifice what he failed to secure by force. Can you see the change of plan now? He sees that force is not working. He tries artifice. Now, I said I like definitions. Look at this one. I wonder if I've, I've got it right there. Right. Let's see what the advice is. Uh, okay. Little by little, this is his advice, by the way. The artifice means cunning uh, 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 and de deception. By all means, you know, deception qualifies in so many things. Infiltration, masquerading, you can name it. But deception was his strategy. Let's see how it, whether or not it worked. From the same book says, little by little, at first by stealth and silence, and then more openly as it increased in strength. Remember, we are talking about the devil himself, who we know is the dragon, who has actually given his power to the beast that we know to have 10 horns and uh, the crowns on their horns. This is the beast found in Daniel chapter 7 and Revelation chapter 13. This is the same beast, whether you want to consider it from a pagan point of view or we want to consider it from a papal or uh, pseudo-Christian point of view. But what it is, is this is the strategy they, they're doing. They didn't come full force at first. It says little by little. At first in stealth. Stealth means coming. Now, you've seen animals, uh, especially uh, lions, when they attack their prey. They don't call full force. They go stealthily. They will make sure they don't make a sound as to startle the animal. They will make sure they don't alert the animal in advance until they are in a, a, a distance where they can leap and grab their prey. So exactly uh, what the enemy did here. Little by little, at first in stealth and silence, and then more openly as it increased in strength and gained control of the minds of Man, the mystery of iniquity carried forward its deceptive and blasphem blasphemous work, almost imperceptibly, imperceptibly. In other words, that word means um, unnoticeably. You know, at times it, it would it, it wouldn't seem that things were happening, and yet they were. So, almost imperceptibly, the customs of the heathenism found their way into the Christian church. That the enemy working by artifice now. Because working outside the walls of the Christian church wouldn't work. Now, I'm looking at this word again. I was looking for, for this slide before, but here I got it. Artifice means 
clever cunning devices or expedients, especially as used to trick or deceive others. That's what it exactly means. And that's exactly what the enemy did. Now, let's go back to Daniel 7, verse 25. He will speak up against the Most High and oppress the saints of the Most High. Brethren, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, wherever you are, the enemy of the dragon or the, the, the war of the dragon is to get at God by whatever means. Unfortunately, there is only one thing on earth here the enemy could get. It is that which was created in God's image. And this is a human being, you and me. When he is fought God or when he's fighting God, he doesn't forget to fight those who are his saints. In other words, representing him not only by image, but by keeping his commandments and keeping his testimony. Now it says he intending to change the, the appointed times. Who appoints the time in this case? It is God himself, the creator of the universe. When he created the earth and perhaps other galaxies, right? He puts the laws and times. He sets out how time should be counted. He sets, out, he sets out when the day starts and when the day ends. He is the one commanding the new moons. But when this beast comes or when this conspirator comes, he comes and hits exactly where God has put. Now, anyone who comes and undermines the law that you have put, whether it's in your house or company, they are picking a fight with you. Now, let us look at this. The enemy diligently sought to change the law of God. Diligently did so. What does that mean? It means they had to plan meticulously. Now, why would they do that? The question comes. Why would they want to change the laws of God? Remember, I say, God put these laws in place. Now, when he put the laws in place, God was trying to show the world something here. Why? Because the law of God is his character and his authority. Let's look at this. Briefly, this is the commandment of God. Now you can see they've been paraphrased there, especially the, 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 the fourth one, because it's more verbose uh, uh, from Exodus 20, verses 8 to 11. But we're going to read it in detail. This is what the Lord God himself has put as a commandment reflecting his character. Now, if you consider very much for tonight, I will allow you not to look at uh, from commandment five to 10, but to look from commandment one to four, because those are the ones that hit enormously to the heart of God. Now, look at what the enemy has put. The fourth commandment in God's original uh, writing on stone by his own finger and the two tablets of stones has been made number three because the one about images has been removed entirely. And there is another one, the last one, which has been split into two, at least to make them 10. That's counterfeit uh, commandment. Now, I want us to briefly go over these laws. I do not want to assume that everyone knows what this law or the Ten Commandments are. Exodus 20, verse 1 to 3. And God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. Now God, this is his signature. All that follows up are below is his word. Now, God's writing or writing style, if he was writing a letter today, perhaps this sentence could have been at the, at, the, at the end of the letter, but he chose to write it that way so that people won't ask questions as to who said this. So this is God, the almighty Jehovah, the creator of the universe, who has said this. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. Now, what follows then? He says, you shall not have, uh, you shall have no other gods before me. He says that. You shall not make yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, 
punishing the children of the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me by showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. Remember, it is God who said it. Verse one and two is putting his signature very clearly. We can't question who put the laws. It is God himself. Verse seven says, you shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. I, I have to choose to read them as they are, as they appear in the 10 commandments. Verse 11, uh, 8 to 11 says, remember, we could go on with the word remember the Sabbath because it means it wasn't the first time the Sabbath was being mentioned here, or it wasn't the first time the Sabbath was known. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son or your daughter or your daughter, nor your male or female servant, nor your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your town. For in six days, the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Now, I have chosen the first four, obvious four, obvious reasons. I said I want us to focus on these first four because that's where the sovereign of God, his authority, his power is really best. Now, by removing the commandment, it says, you shall not have any uh, image or worship them. It shows that this beast or the conspirator wanted that to be done. Now, let us pause a little bit here and consider the following points. The law of God is perfect, eternal, and it is a law of life. Many verses that talk about that. It is central in the heavenly sanctuary. Now, if you know how the earthly tabernacle was created. The architecture was a, a replica of the heavenly sanctuary. Now, if here below the law that Moses, uh, the Ten Commandments uh, that Moses was commanded to put in the Ark of the Covenant under the mercy city in the most holy place, it shows you what those laws are. They are in the heart of the temple, right under the mercy city of God's presence. That should tell you something about the law of God. Now, I cannot even guess this. The truth is anyone who attacks that kind of law that God on himself sits on, it means they are a great conspirator, a very brave one for that matter. The law of God is a part of God and reveals him to us and the foundation of his throne. It is a transcript of his character. Listen to this. Unchangeable, a finite expression of the infinite. The law of God was intended not to be changed. It actually, it doesn't change. You see, how we think as human beings and as, as the enemy or the conspirator that we are talking about, we think by changing the law of God, we have changed it. The truth is no. The law of God remains the same. What, we, what human beings have only done is to create their own laws parallel to God's laws. So I can emphasize tonight that the law of God is unchangeable and it is infinite and it will stay forever. It is a glimpse of the mind of God. The fourth commandment is about the Sabbath. It is distinct and the only one which deals with time. It is the heart of the law. It is the test commandment, a sign of obedience as in the gathering of manna. You know the story in Exodus 16 where Moses had to command from, obviously the command was from God, that they should have collected, they, 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 they would collect manna for six days. On the first day, second day, up to the fifth day, they would collect portions adequate or enough for their meal on the day, not to collect anything more. 
Because if they did, hoping to keep for the following day, it would go stale or it would actually rot. But on the sixth day, to show that God was in this matter, he had to command them to collect double the portion. Because on the seventh day, manna wouldn't be rained and they, it wouldn't be there for them to collect. But to show that God was on this, the one that they would have collected on the fifth or on the sixth day would not go stale. It would feed them on the seventh day. How amazing. It is a miracle on its own, which can explain the validity and the authenticity of the Sabbath. Now, the fourth uh, commandment, it is a sign between God and man, a sign of sanctification. Now we know Genesis 2, verse 1 to 3, it talks about God having finished the creation. He blesses the Sabbath. He rests on it and he sanctifies it as a peculiar different day. The fourth commandment, it shows the creatorship or the rulership and the sovereignty of God. Rejecting the Sabbath can be equated to rejecting the whole law of God and himself because it deals with time. It has to be by faith. Sabbath at creation, as I've mentioned, and Sabbath at redemption. It means a lot. When God had created, he rested on the Sabbath. When God had redeemed what he created, from the beginning which had gone lost or which had gone astray, when he had redeemed, he had to rest in the tomb. The keeping of the Sabbath, this is a quotation from M.L. Andreasen, a very prolific writer, powerful writer of uh, the, 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 the 19th century. The keeping of the Sabbath rests upon faith only. Men cannot reason it out upon the basis of human experience and research. If they accept the Sabbath at all, they accept it because of their faith in God. How amazing is that? You see, the enemy knows this that and, and chose to conspire by changing what had been inscribed by God himself with his own finger. Depicting, you see, writing by his own thing. You see, God could have instructed Moses to do it. He did instruct Moses to write some other uh, ritual or ceremonial laws. But on these specific ones, he had to write those himself. Now, we could go on about uh, the type of stone he wrote on them. He didn't just pick the stones, he had to pick the stones that were part of his seat, part of his throne. He chooses to take that stone and with his own finger, rise the Ten Commandments, which shows the immutability or unchangeability of the law. And it was kept in the covenant. This is powerful because if you had never thought about the Sabbath this way, I want, us to, I want you to think Carefully, because I keep the Sabbath not because the Bible says so, but I'm keeping the Sabbath because God, Almighty, the Creator, said so. We know the Bible is His word. It is our faith in that word, the Bible, that God instructed you and me to keep the seventh day of the week holy as He did Himself. Now, I am asking a question here. If God does not change, why would his law, which depicts his character or that depicts him, change? Why would it change? A brief history. We cannot exhaust this. Sun worship was a common, uh, was common among the heathens over whom Constantine presided. He chose, remember Constantine, uh, obviously inherited a system where the saints of God who were keeping the commandments of God were being persecuted. Now, we know that because they were not uh, succeeding in that uh, endeavor of using force, they had to do something. Now, he chose to unite Christians and pagans. That's when the, the plan of him to be baptized came into effect. Following fierce persecution of the church, Emperor Constantine was baptized in 311 AD, uh, uh, AD, 
decided to become friends with the church. In AD 321, March 7, Constantine decreed Sunday a public holy day. In the Council of Laodicea, a, and also officially the National Sunday Law. Now, you can see, after decreeing it in the Council of Laodicea, the, 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 the Church of Rome or the Council of the Roman Empire endorsed the Sunday Law. And the Second Council of Nicaea uh, endorsed the image worship. Now, the, you understand why it's no longer in the, uh, the Ten Commandments of God, that particular uh, law which talks about image worshiping had to be uh, removed because it was endorsed in that year. Now, this is from the, the book again. I want us to follow closely what I'm going to say here. In nearly every council, this is the state has now become friend with the church. They're using now Instead of force, they are using artifice, which is the cunning uh, devices to make sure people are, are deceived. The quotation says, in nearly every council, the Sabbath which God had instituted was pressed down a little lower while the Sunday was correspondingly exalted. Thus the pagan festival became finally to be honored as a divine institution while the Bible Sabbath was pronounced a relic of Judaism and its observers were declared to be a curse. Now, let me pause here by saying, Sabbath doesn't start when Jews are in existence. It starts when God has created humanity and before the nations were in existence. So anyone who wants to use an argument that the Sabbath was created after the Jews were, misses the point. Because if you follow history, the Sabbath has always been there. And Abraham himself, after accepting the Lord as his, as, as his uh, Lord or God, he was worshiping. And the, Jude, uh, the Jews are from his loins. You know, he, he bears Isaac, Isaac bears the twins, Jacob and, and Esau, and the Jews are from the loins of Jacob. So where is the Judaism with the Sabbath there? The Sabbath precedes, comes first to the Jews. The great apostate had succeeded now by artifice. The great apostate had succeeded in exalting himself above all that is called God or that, uh, or that is worship, is a quotation from 2 Thessalonians 2 there. He had dared to change the only precept of divine law that unmistakable points all humanity to the true and living God. In the fourth commandment, God is revealed as the creator of the heavens and the earth and is thereby distinguished from all false gods. It was a memorial of the work of creation that the seventh day was sanctified as a rest for a day for men. Seeking to change the heart of the law of God is the epitome of the great conspiracy against God and his sovereignty. Never will anything surpass this open and callous act of changing the Sabbath from the seventh day to the first day of the week. Now, those who are old enough, they will remember that our week officially, even the calendars, started on Sunday going to Saturday. Now, if you look on the calendar, that calendars that are, 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 are common, they start from Monday, and having Sunday as the seventh day. It's, it's, it's a blow, it's deliberate that that happens because there are Sabbatarians, those people who believe in the Sabbath, but who mistakenly think that Sunday is Sabbath. And then they can therefore justify that, look, the calendar says seventh day, therefore we are keeping the right Sabbath. It's a ploy by the conspirator. He knows clearly that by so doing, he will confuse many. Now, the generation of my children will not understand because when they came into the scene, they found the calendar maybe starting on a Monday. But I know clearly that the calendars were starting from Sunday 
to Saturday, which made the counting even for the confused clear. Now it makes the confused more confused. The Roman Catholic claims the authority of changing the day of worship. I want people to know that it wasn't God who changed the Sabbath. It is the Roman Catholic that he has admitted and claims it actually wants the credit for that. Anyone who doesn't know that the Sunday was changed by Catholic are missing the point because there will come a time when Catholic will by default claim them as their daughters. During the old law, this is from the Catholic Catechism, Catechism. During the old law, Saturday was the day sanctified, but the church, which is the Roman Catholic Church, instructed by Jesus, this is a lie, and directed by the Spirit of God, has substituted Sunday for Saturday. So now we sanctify the first, not the seventh. Sunday means and now is the day of the Lord. That is what they are putting to the world. But you and me should know tonight that this is an artifice, this is a deception, a deliberate way of deceiving the world. Remember, this is aimed at the heart of the law of God. Why? Because the enemy is still fighting the war that he started up in heaven against God himself. The very act of changing the Sabbath into Sunday, which Protestants allow of, because by keeping Sunday strictly, they acknowledge the church's power to ordain feasts and to command them under. Now, what I'm saying is any Protestant, any Sunday keeping church knowingly or unknowingly, they are paying homage to Roman Catholic, because Roman Catholic claims the authority of having changed to this. So anyone who keeps the Sunday as their day of worship are only taking after the Roman Catholic because Catholic does not hide it. They're not missing their words in this. They, have, they, they claim to have the authority to change it, but any Protestant who is taking after them is by default, agreeing and paying homage. Romanists declare that the observance of Sunday by Protestants is an homage they pay in spite of themselves to the authority of the Catholic Church. Now, some people may think, you know, we, I've been talking about Constantine and um, uh, 311 or 321 AD. Let's forget about that. Let's talk about what happens in our contemporary times. Those who know Pope John Paul, I remember him very well. I, I, I know him very well. Um, he died when I was mature enough to understand things. Now, he wrote this letter to, his, to the church, which is called Dice Domini, uh, obviously keeping the Lord's day. Now, the understanding of Pope John Paul he says the Lord's Day is Sunday. There is a lot of uh, dissertations around that because they have made it the Lord's Day. Although the Bible has not claimed that in any case, the Lord's Day where God claims the day to be his is in Genesis chapter two, uh, after it created, he, he claimed the Sabbath his. In Exodus, he claims, Exodus 20, uh, verse 11 to uh, 8 to 11, he claims the Sabbath to be his. But the Sunday or the first day of the week, he doesn't claim. So this system which has made it his day wants to pursue and, 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 and then show, uh, promulgate the change uh, to the Sabbath. Now listen to what Pope John says in the letter. I'm, I'm summarizing here. He he desired Sunday to be made a moral obligation for Christians by trying to knit it to the Ten Commandments and even quotes Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 12 to 15. You know, he, he says it should be kept holy, which are the attributes of what the Sabbath, the seventh day Sabbath should be. But he is knitting it, he's knitting Sunday into this to 
uh, make it an authentic Sabbath day, but we know it isn't. He also wants to, uh, and to be uh, an ecclesiastical enforcing parishioners to attend Sunday Mass. Now you will see uh, following that, that there is a quotation from his book, we say, uh, from this letter, we say, the Sunday Eucharist, in other words, what is central in his writing or in the Catholic thinking is that people have to attend Mass. Now, listen to this thought. The Sunday Eucharist is the foundation and confirmation of all Christian practice. Now, if you listen to a, a presentation before uh, unmasking the Antichrist, you realize that the priesthood or the priests of the Catholic Church claim that they can turn the bread or the, the waffles that they give to the parishioners into the real body of Christ. Uh, there is a word called the transubstantiation. It is a concept where they think they can create Christ anew by changing that bread and make him alive. No, so to them, by having life Christ through that wafer or, 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 or bread, it becomes imperative for every Christian in their thinking to attend Sunday mass because if they don't do so, you can see from the quotation, they will be deliberately a failing or those who deliberately fail in this obligation commit a grave sin. Now, can you see when the understanding that breaking or not attending mass becomes a grave sin, what will happen if people don't accept Sunday keeping? In their view, Sunday worship, uh, this is uh, central to their uh, worship. Now, you can see that in the Sabbath is the observance of a 24 hour cycle. In the Sunday, men, Sunday keeping mentality, it's more of a service rather than the whole 24 hours. Now, Samuel Bakioki, those, uh, some of us had the chance of meeting him when he was alive. Unfortunately, it's late now. But he was a very prolific writer who investigated the Sabbath, having come from uh, Italy himself, uh, born and bred in, in Rome, so to speak, he had to dig deeper what the Sabbath entailed. Now he says, he, he was responding to the Dice Domini, the pastoral letter written by Pope John Paul. He says, while Protestant churches encourage, not the word, encourage their members to attend Sunday services, the Catholic church obliges them to attend mass. So that's first matter in a way, if you look at it closely. Pope John Paul continues to say, when through the centuries, she, meaning the Catholic Church, has made laws concerning Sunday rest, the church has had in mind above all the work of servants and workers, certainly not because this work was any less worthy when compared to the spiritual requirements of Sunday observance, but rather because it needed greater regulation. Hold there. Greater regulation. Does something ring a bell? A law is on the way. It, uh, because it is needed, uh, needed greater regulation to lighten its burden and thus enable everyone to keep the Lord's day holy. Now, the conspirator has changed the law of God and is trying to force the people to keep the so-called Lord's day. Now, look at this. If the Sabbath is the sign or the mark of God, according to Ezekiel 20, then the counterfeit Sabbath, which is the Sunday, can only be the mark or the sign of the devil. So if we have those points clearly, we cannot argue about that. So when that becomes a law, what will happen? Revelation 13, verse 5 to 8. The beast was given a mouth to utter proud words and blasphemies and, the uh, and to exercise its authority for 42 months, it opened its mouth to blaspheme God and to slander his name and his dwelling place and those who live in heaven. It was given power to wage war against God's holy people and to conquer them. And it was given authority over every tribe, people, and language, and nation. 
Now mark the red words. In all, or all inhabitants of the earth will worship the beast, all whose names have not been written in the Lamb's book of life. The Lamb who was slain from the creation of the world. Okay, let's come to conclusions here. Accepting the mark of the beast and this and these consequences now. By accepting the mark of the beast, which we've identified to be the Sunday keeping, instead of Sabbath keeping the seventh day Sabbath of, uh, of the week, and accepting the first day of the week as the day in which God uh, seeks to be worshipped or uh, re- uh, for us to rest, there should be consequences, therefore. Revelation 14, verse 9 to 10. It talks of drinking of the wine of the wrath of God and torment with fire and brimstone. Now, when it talks of the wrath of God, other versions or somewhere in the, in the, in the book of Revelation talks of drinking the wine of God unmixed. Now, those who have uh, drank some strong drinks, uh, maybe not alcohol, but uh, those that need dilution, you know when you drink it and dilute it, the consequences speak for themselves because you will feel unwell. Now, thinking, drinking the, the, the wrath of God is, is by no means comparable to that. And those who accept the mark of the beast, now the mark of the beast, we have concluded that it is accepting Sunday worship. It means, according to Revelation 16 verse 2, they're going to be a loathsome source for those who do so. It also says in Revelation 19, verse 17 to 21, those who accept the mark of the beast are going to be totally annihilated. Now, we learned in the past presentations that when the hand or when the stone that shall be cut out with no hand, according to Daniel chapter 2, when that stone, which is the rock, Christ himself, the redeemer of the world, shall come, he will come and hit hard, especially at the feet and uh, of the iron and clay of this kingdom. We know that kingdom is the same kingdom that we are talking about as the beast with ten horns, uh, seven heads, ten horns, or ten crowns. So here comes a further qualification. Because that system or that conspirator has made people to accept the mark of the beast by deception, there, there is going to be annihilation. There's going to be the love some souls. Anyone who has accepted that is going to face those consequences. I remember one of my brothers when they presented about the plagues that are going to come upon those who have received the mark of the beast. He even mentioned that just thinking about it, you feel the body sensations happening in your body. I do not want to start describing how the, those who accept the mark of the beast are going to be annihilated at the end. But we know when Christ shall come and establish his kingdom, he will make sure those who have conspired against his law are dealt with once and for all. Sunday, enforcement is coming. Verse 16 of Revelation chapter 13 says, it also forced all people great and small, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark of on their right hand or on their forehead. Now, that prophecy, it, it, it doesn't necessarily mean having a mark on the head, but by accepting Sunday, like we do when we accept the Sabbath, we are actually saying our minds and our hand we are accepting God. Whatever we do with our hands has to show that we are accepting God. Whatever we accept by our heads, we are worshiping God. So vice versa, or should I say contrary, those who accept the mark of the beast mean, as we have seen, that they will be worshiping the beast and they will be marveling against the beast. So by what, taking their mark or his mark, they will be worshiping him. So those who will not be worshiping the beast are going to face these consequences, which is going to be temporary, by the way. It says also, this beast will force all those who are great or small. Now, if you are not great, you are small like me. If you are not rich, you are poor like me. If you are not free, 
like me, you are a slave like me. In other words, everyone is, in, is included. Every person, every individual, every human being alive when the Sunday enforcement comes will be forced to do that. It says, so that they could not buy or sell. Now, buying and selling is our life. And when that doesn't happen, it becomes a, 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 a punishment for those who wouldn't have accepted the mark of the beast. Now he says, this calls for wisdom. Someone has presented about that. But what I want us to know is, the seventh day Sabbath is the ultimate test of our faith. Nations will continue despising it, rejecting it, and trying to find biblical evidence in order to reject it. But what all we know is it is a conspiracy against the law of God. Let us recap. The enemy of God, the Antichrist, he has drove over the ages to attack God through undermining and substituting his laws for human laws. Having Sunday as a day of worship in the place of the seventh day is the greatest of conspiracies the world has ever seen. What happens then? God will judge mercilessly those who have changed his holy day and they have taught many to accept it as it is from the Lord. However, there is hope. There is hope. If you didn't know, please, you know today. Acts chapter 17 verse 30 says, and the times of the, this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men and women for that matter everywhere to repent and acknowledge and investigate this truth that we are telling you tonight. By the way, when we present these things, it's never by force or by might. It is to arouse your curiosity, your God-given intelligence to go and research and dig for yourself prayerfully, seeking for the truth. You will see where the truth sits because the truth resides in God and he has revealed it in his Bible. The conspirator has tried by all means to deceive you, has tried by all means to, uh, to do everything so that you cannot see the character of God in his law. My call tonight is that Babylon, the great, is falling. Very soon, it will be decimated. It shall be no more. And God calls his children in Revelation by saying, come out of here, my people. Come out of here because it's falling. It's not sustainable to be in there. It's not safe to be in there. Get the call and come out when the time is still there. The great conspiracy of all ages. It's been unraveled tonight. It remains with you whether or not you want to accept this truth. But the truth is when God has given such truth, he expects reaction from you and me. Let us pray. My God and my Father, thank you for your love, which includes revealing your secrets to us. You have said in your way that you will not do anything unless you send a message through your prophets. We've got the Bible. You've got given messages to men and women of the world and in our present time so that the world may be awakened to the truths of your kingdom. Tonight, I want to plead with you, O oh God, to speak to every heart that is hearing my voice and those that are going to be watching this in the, in the future. Trouble them, don't give them peace. Even those that are going to want to ignore the truth and suppress it, don't give them peace until they accept and listen to your voice. All I know is that you are more than able to speak to them. You're more than able to change their thinking. You're more than able to give them the truth in abundance. All I'm praying for, Father, is that write our names in the book of life. Only because we have kept thy law as you, you gave it on the Mount of Sinai. 
help us to understand the significance of understanding that the law is your character. Therefore, it is unchangeable and no human being will ever change it. Even the devil himself cannot. Thank you, Father, for being a God you are. Save your children tonight. Serve them into your kingdom because all you want is that everyone should not perish, but be saved into your kingdom. This is my humble prayer in that magnificent name of Jesus because it is the name that we've been given here below to pray with, to pray in knowing that answers come because it is the name that surpasses all name. Amen. want to thank Elder Sima Moyo for that wonderful presentation. The law of the Lord has been placed, it has been given ages ago, but there is a great controversy going on to change these laws. And this has been opened to us so well this evening. Join us tomorrow as we unravel more of these prophecies and as we go deeper into what these conspiracies are, how the laws are being changed, who are changing these laws and what is our role, where do we stand? So thank you so much for joining us. We'll see you tomorrow evening at half seven. Have a good night, God bless you all.